Mr. Director? Um, my, my colleague brought up a very good point, which is something we realized um, even before the testing phase and release one, which is, you know, very far back, expecting boards and bureaus to understand what they need to change, you know, in their system, in their own internal operation um, to meet a new system that they have never seen before and has problems with requirements was unfair at best. So one of the largest lessons learned that, you know, in addition to the, the design methodology that we've uh, improved has been a change management uh, contract. It is absolutely essential because we're taking boards and bureaus who are on pretty much a green screen system into a brand new um, web-based system that's mouse-based and we're, we need to walk them through where in their business process they can change clean efficiencies. Maybe they don't need to print reports. Maybe they, they don't need to print and make a file. It can be digitized. So I, I want to um, underscore what my colleague just said with regard to that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Chair Bonilla. Um, Mr. Ramos, the, the question of the, the code and, uh, you know, the, the keys to the kingdom and who holds them, what is your answer and solution to this issue? Uh, so, so part of the negotiations were to get us the keys to the kingdom, not to own the code, but to have the rights to it. Just to be able to, yeah. Right. It, it's a key factor in being able to maintain the system going forward. That's part of the reason why we, we had to negotiate that. And again, that is a negotiation. Yeah. You don't, you, I can't just dictate to Accenture, give it to us. It, right, it's something what, that we have to negotiate. But where are we today and are, are we going to be successful in that negotiation? I mean, what's... Sure. Uh, let me ask let Marnell who, who heads up our... Again, my name is Marnell Voss. Um, we are striving for success. We are successful in um, the rights to the work product. So anything that is developed at this point from Accenture or has been in the past and or from their software uh, supplier um, is owned by the state or any other state entity or government entity could utilize that software. So this software supplier um, actually was did a lot of business with the state of Florida so was able to use the government, uh, we were able to start with that, some of those codes for the licenses and that kind of thing. Somebody else would be able to take advantage of what California has um, had to do at this point in time um, as far as the software. So we do have government purpose rights, which is very important. Um, now, um, we do need an escrow account. We need the um, software to be um, held in escrow in case there was, you know, goodness forbid, the supplier to go out of business. Um, we would want to be able to then own that software and be able to keep it under maintenance and operations ourselves. So that is something that we are working towards in um, getting that escrow account for the software. Is it just an account you need, or I mean, and what's going to be it's involved in the in? amendment? The amendment that we're um, this uh, amendment we're discussing would achieve that ultimate goal. Yes, would achieve that ultimate goal. Actually, the right government purpose rights. We already um, one of the reasons why we did the um, amendment under maintenance and operations is so we could have some of the maintain some of those rights as we move forward, developing um, code and making sure that we had um, those rights to own that code, um, although Accenture, again, would have the same rights to use that code when selling to some other state entity or government entity or private. So yes, eventually we are striving and it is part of the negotiations to have the escrow account so that if the software supplier were to go out of business or we were to terminate, we would be able to um, have access to the code. Short answer. <laughs> we have uh, secured the rights. We're, we're putting it into escrow so that if the supplier goes out of business, we'll have that access to it there. Right. Mr. Mr. Wood. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, big picture. How do we protect the state in the future from something like this happening again? How do we protect ourselves from <laughs> bargaining away our protected position, putting ourselves vulnerable to huge cost overruns and products that we just get that just simply don't work? How do we protect ourselves? 
Well, I, I think we need to do it right from the beginning as far as the planning, Caltech being involved in early on in assessing the project, determining whether or not the agency has the technical expertise or not, um, and then making sure the appropriate people are involved. Certainly, all of it is under Caltech now as far as approving RFPs, approving uh, procurement documents, contracts. So I think we've got to start uh, at the very beginning and making sure that we don't make any missteps in the planning stages and, and the contractual, entering in, into the contractual agreement. And then throughout the project, just make sure there is appropriate oversight and the willingness to stop if we are running into problems. Mr. Ramos. Um, Mr. Woods, if you don't mind, I'd like to add into that. There's a couple of other protections that the state could, could uh, put in place. One is you need competition on these bids. We ended up with a single bidder. So anything that we can do to improve the procurement process, which we are striving to do uh, now that it's under us, to, to generate more competition, then the state's not put into a position of having to accept onerous terms or, or make compromises that are not in our, in our best interest. Also gives you the opportunity to evaluate multiple options, multiple technical solutions as well. Uh, the other thing is to, is to tie in procurement to the oversight process so that you can begin mitigating risk right from the beginning. So those are things that we can and are doing uh, today to make sure that we don't get into the situation of getting into having to accept terms that are just not favorable. I, I guess what concerns me the most is that we had, we had someone waving a red flag, you know, for seven months that we had problems here. And yet apparently it, that was, somebody didn't, nobody saw the flag. Sounds like it was a pretty big flag. Well, you know, Again, this was before my time. This was in, you know, when things were different. My, my department as an agency was not even in its current form at that point. Back in 2009 when the project was approved, 2010 when the procurement started, and 2011, you know, when it, when it concluded. Um, I think it's fair to say that the environment was significantly different back then. Um, and under the Brown administration, we've taken efforts to, one, make sure that agencies work closely together that were more aligned and that you know, for the process from end to end is, is more tightly coupled. So I think we have better opportunities for that as well. Plus, as I mentioned, every single project that, is, that we've provided oversight on or that has run into problems, or even the successful ones, we've done an assessment of it, what, what worked and what didn't work well, and then implemented those lessons learned. So I, I think we're in a position now that's much better positioning the state than we were back in 2010 and 2011. And, and just a final question, if I miss this, I, I apologize. So is there a summary of the overall cost of this entire incident and what it's cost our licensees and, and our departments, the terminated contract, the, the cost overruns? What is the, to what's the bottom line here? So that, that cost that you speak of is in SPR 3.1, uh, the, the, the cost of the project um, inclusive of release one, release two, mm -hmm. and ending there is uh, just short of 96 million. I believe it's 95.4 million dollars. And that includes the 86 million dollars for termination? No, uh, the, the 86 million for termination would be essentially that in the event we had to terminate, and go into a cost scenario, mm -hmm. that's what the, the financial and programmatic exposure would be to the state. That is a separate uh, cost analysis that, that, that we did. So worst case scenario could be $180 million? No, it's not. I, I, I'm a little on. It's e I'm sorry, it's either, either or. or. Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, but that's, I, I think for clarity's sake, the, the issue is that the $96 million is for phase one and phase two, which is half of the original contract, which would have been $27 million. So we could be looking at 180 or $200 million when we get what we originally agreed to pay for, which was the $27 million and for the whole 38 programs. Yes. If I could, if I could, Mr. Chairman, um, absolutely, after the cost benefit analysis is conducted, and we, we look at various ways of how to integrate. Um, there will be costs associated with that. However, um, the way we are seeking to position ourselves is to directly mitigate costs. There could be some programs that we can integrate with internal staff, uh, smaller boards, 
you know, less configuration problems, uh, very little risk associated with data conversion. You juxtapose that to contractors board, which may require um, additional support and everything in between. So the way the state is seeking to position itself is to directly mitigate that risk and not get into the position that we're in currently. Thank you, Senator Bates, and then the Assembly Member Chain. Uh, yes, uh, at the County of Orange, we had a number of these issues over the uh, several years that I um, participated. I'm curious as to why we only had one bidder. Ours were very robust uh, procurement. A lot of people came forward. Uh, unfortunately, at the end of that, we still had the same problems, many of which we're experiencing here with promises made that couldn't be kept on the part of the contractor. So when we only have one bidder, we're kind of walking into that. What can we do to provide a more robust uh, procurement? So, uh, some, uh, Member Bates, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're a senator or assemblywoman, but so I apologize. Just call me pass, okay. <laughs> Good, <bad. laughs> Mrs. Bates. <laughs> um, so uh, I can't speak directly to the Breeze procurement because as I said, I wasn't around back then and it was in, in my department. But I will tell you, uh, since I've been back, uh, since I've been with the state, one of the first things that I did is ask the vendors, why, are, why don't you guys bid? Because we find ourselves in this situation over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the feedback I got. Our procurement processes take too long. It's not uncommon for them to take years. Uh, and I, I don't mean just one or two, all right? So they're very long. Uh, it's very costly for bidders to bid. Uh, secondly, the process is relatively bureaucratic and at a certain point in time in the past, we'd put a bid out or a procurement out on the street and then kind of shut down communication with the vendor community. We call it the cone of silence comes down. So where they're not able, not, they're not able to get clarifications from the state, uh, ask about why are you asking for this or we don't understand this requirement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so our processes were, were essentially messed up. Uh, we've taken great uh, strides to try and change that. So we've made the procurements much uh, faster. We've shortened the cycle. I think right now our average time is less than nine, nine months, which for state purposes, that's actually almost light speed, you know, compared to what it used to be. Uh, we've opened the process where we're much more able to have open dialogue with, uh, with the bidder community. We've done things like publish uh, draft bids one or two times before we actually submit the, pub, the actual bid so that vendors can come in and say, hey, uh, we don't understand this or we think you missed the mark here or, so that they can provide feedback and they can understand what they're getting themselves into. Uh, we've gotten better results since then, uh, but those are the, generally the sorts of issues that lead to, to just having a single bidder. Okay, thank you. Assem thank you, Assembly Member Chain. Thank you. Um, on Wood's, um, comments um, regarding oversight and I know you had mentioned uh, the auditor had mentioned um, that Caltech needed to be on board however given the uh, report uh, that was published on March 19th regarding um, Caltech and the issues there I mean, I don't think I have, I don't feel comfortable that we're going to have the assurances regarding oversight, right, because of the issues with Caltech as well. I want to make sure that this mess doesn't continue. Frankly, it's, it's upsetting in how much it's costing, you know, um, the public at this point. Yes, Ms. Hall? Uh, with all due respect, um, I, absolutely, I think that's what our report talks about, and there, and, and Caltech has a, a, a role, and, and honestly, as far as Mr. Carp, Mr. Ramos may not have been here, but Caltech was involved in this project from the beginning. They were responsible for approving the FSR back in 2009. They were responsible for approving other uh, issues related to the RFP uh, back in 2010. So there was, may not have been Mr. Ramos, and Caltech may have been in a different structure, but that's part of what we were trying to address in the report we issued last week with respect to information technology, governance, and oversight. Um, there needs to be a clear understanding of responsibilities. And uh, the issue we tried to raise in that report is this conflicting role of being an advisor and assisting departments that don't have the technical expertise, but also having the ability to stop a project and, and require the department to do a cost-benefit analysis or require the department to correct issues before we continue. Because one of the other issues that we raised in this report is 
there are these various special project reports where the project cost is increasing uh, by 10 percent or the, the time frame, which usually leads to higher costs. And we looked at these SPRs, and Caltech raised some very important issues, for example, in SPR 2, which was an SPR that was presented in, in 2013. At that point, the cost estimate is getting up to $78 million. When we looked at that, or our IT expert looked at that, Caltech raised a lot of very important issues that needed to be corrected. But even though many of those <coughs> issues had not been corrected by SPR 3, which came in at over $100 million, they went ahead and approved SPR 3. So again, it's a difficult job for, for, for Caltech to do, but we would agree with you. We think that there needs to be very specific um, guidance for staff at, at Caltech. When do I recommend suspension? When do I re recommend termination? When do I basically tell a department, we are not going to approve this. You have to make sure that the vendor fixes these issues. You need to make sure that these things are corrected before we're willing to approve the SPR. We know that this is an important system for the state, but we don't want to continue to spend money, um, good money after bad, in, in my opinion, uh, where the, the costs continue to escalate. But again, I think it has to go back to the beginning. I think some of the issues Mr. Ramos just mentioned, um, absolutely, competition is difficult. When you only have one vendor bidding, do you decide to go ahead and go forward with that bidder? Um, or do you go back to square one and say, we need to start over and maybe cut this project back? Um, but again, we believe, and we've discussed in this report and the report we issued last week with respect to information, information technology, government governance, oversight, planning, procurement, the execution of, of projects, uh, really, again, is an issue that we think needs continued attention, but there really needs to be very specific guidance and understanding uh, within the department uh, and their staff as to when do I elevate something and then ultimately when is it decided we've got to suspend this project um, and, and be willing to tell a department like Consumer Affairs, we're not going to continue with this. There's too many issues. Uh, it's just not working. Chair Bonilla? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Jones? Thank you, Senator Hill. I want to, as we're wrapping up, kind of um, go back to some things that were said earlier. Uh, Mr. Dodd, Mr. Wood, myself, Mr. Hill mentioned, uh, you know, our constituents being the licensees. I'm a licensee. I think Mr. Wood is a licensee. There might be other licensees on this on this panel. And uh, Mrs. Bonilla mentioned the culture. And, I, you know, I know that sometimes, you know, being in, the, in a big bureaucracy in the state government, we lose sight of what these dollars really mean when we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of licensees you know, the license fees add up. I, I just did some real quick calculations. And I'm going to, I would encourage you to go get the actual accurate numbers on these, but I'm just going to go off with a third of the licensee fee goes to pay for this breeze system from some of these licensee fees. A third, 40 or $50 goes directly out of our constituents, our licensees' pockets to pay for this breeze system that doesn't work. Now for maybe some in this room, 40 or 50 bucks isn't a big deal, but let me tell you for a barber or a cosmetologist, 40 or 50 bucks is a new pair of scissors that they can use to expand their business and make more money. 40 or 50 bucks for a registered nurse might be a week's worth of gas to get back and forth to work. 40 or 50 bucks for a dental hygienist or a dental assistant might be a pair of new shoes or a couple of pair of new shoes for their kids. This might not be real money to Accenture. This might not be real money to the people that work for the state of Cal in the, in the bureaucracies when we're talking about multiple millions of dollars towards a system that doesn't work. But to the licensees, this is real money. And I would encourage you to go through the, each one of these licensees, find out how much each licensee's had to pay towards this breeze system and the next time you go to the, to the barber, the next time you go to the dentist, the next time you use one of these services, ask them, what would 50 bucks make a difference in your life towards your job or to your kids? And let's keep that in mind as we're negotiating these contracts with companies like Accenture. And let's make sure they have the proper perspective of what 40 or 50 bucks or whatever the real number is of our licensees when they're paying those fees 
to have the opportunity and the right to work in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Chair Bonilla. Um, just a, a quick question, and, and it's uh, thank you, Assemblyman Jones, for, for bringing up that, that really important point. And I think it's really important to understand that that's what's fueling our uh, frustration here and the irony that this is the Department of Consumer Affairs and consumer, you know, protections, and uh, this is what we're dealing with, and it's it's that's one reason it's so very troubling. But I, I want going back to the original cost. I guess my my question is, was that realistic? The the twenty seven million was it a loss leader? Were we, you know, who you know was there knowledge at that point in time that this price maybe tag was just maybe way too low and it shouldn't be believed? 